Hello everyone and welcome to the chapter 5 flipped activity. So as I've been telling my students all along, this second unit that we'll be going over, chapters 5, 6, and 7, are going to be probably some of the more difficult things that we're going to encounter in microbiology, specifically in this class, because it's really just biochemistry. So what we're going to do in chapter 5 is that we're going to talk about cellular respiration, fermentation, and all of those parts that go to it, and then we're gonna see how those parts all fit together. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. All right, so in the very first part of the flipped activity, it talks about breaking telling the difference between catabolic and anabolic reactions. So as you listened to in the lecture, anabolic reactions are gonna always be building things up, whereas catabolic reactions are building things down. And cellular metabolism is really just a combination of the anabolic and the catabolic reactions. So if we keep in mind that catabolic reactions break things down and anabolic reactions build things up, that should give us a pretty good indication or some clues as to what the answer should be here. So I've already taken the liberty of giving the correct responses, and we're going to blow this up just a bit more. Maybe not that much more. Oh, that's good. All right, so catabolic pathways break down macromolecules into simple components. So what gave that away is that we're breaking things down. Catabolic pathways also release energy. So anytime bonds are being broken, there's an explosion of energy that takes place. So it makes sense that catabolic reactions would release energy. Blank reactions always build macromolecules by combining simpler molecules. That would be anabolic reactions. Remember, anabolic reactions are the exact opposite of catabolic reactions. They're going to be where things are built up. So if in catabolic reactions energy is released, then we can pretty safely assume that anabolic reactions are going to require the input of energy. So number four, anabolic reactions always require energy. That is a true statement. Catabolic reactions provide the building blocks and the energy needed for anabolic reactions. A great example of that would be you ingest food. You ingest that apple that's made of glucose and other different macromolecules, and your body breaks the bond in that carbohydrate, and it's break that breaks that bond to turn that um, carbohydrate into the individual glucose molecules. In addition to that, the energy needed for anabolic reactions is going to be in the form of ATP. Because remember, we have to put in energy in order to build the bonds between those different glucose molecules in order to make a macromolecule. So for catabolic reactions, they're going to be breaking bonds and releasing energy. Anabolic reactions, I know I sound like a broken record, are going to require the input of energy in order to build those bonds. I keep saying these things over and over again because I really wanted to set in for you the importance of understanding these two basic types of reactions between catabolic, catabolic and anabolic reactions because that's going to help you tremendously when it's time to talk about aerobic, anaerobic respiration and fermentation. So look, moving on. Number six, some energy released by catabolic reactions is stored in the form of chemical bonds in ATP. And that's absolutely true. Adenosine triphosphate is the full legal name of ATP. And what it is, is that you have these negatively charged phosphate groups that are tentatively bonded together, which means it's kind of a stressful bond because we know that light charges tend to repel one another. So these negatively charged phosphate groups are kind of tenuously and stressfully bond together that when we break off that final phosphate group, we have an explosion of energy, and that energy is used by the cells to perform various activities. Catabolic reactions couple with ATP synthesis, and anabolic reactions couple with ATP breakdown. And all of that's pretty intuitive at this point. So now moving on to our first video. So as we have done with the videos in the past, although I do recognize that the videos will actually play in this system, um, I think in the interest of time, it's just um, probably more conducive for you all. And if you feel differently, please leave me a comment. Um, let me know um, if it works better for you to watch the videos during this video, during the flipped activity session, or if you prefer to do the videos on your own. So to this week, we're gonna just let you all do the videos on your own. So pause, watch enzyme substrate, non-competition animation, and then come back. Fantastic, now wasn't that, that an interesting video? All right, so now let's set the stage a bit. 
Now that you have an understanding between the two major parts of metabolism, catabolic reactions and anabolic reactions, where catabolic reactions are going to break things down into their smaller monomers or building blocks, and it's also going to release energy. Catabolic reactions require the input of energy in order to build those monomers up into macromolecules such as proteins, lipids, carbohydrates, nucleic acids, and whatnot. Um, and those are the sum total of the chemical events that happen within a cell that we call metabolism. Now that we have established that, now we're going to talk about exactly how those catabolic and anabolic reactions can take place. And one of the ways that that can be facilitated is through the use of enzymes. Enzymes are biological catalysts that help to speed up the rate of a reaction by reducing the amount of energy that's required for that reaction to take place. So there are some reactions that happen within a cell that they would probably happen on their own, but they would take such a long time for the, the two parts that need to react for them to orient themselves in such a way that a reaction could take place. So in comes an enzyme that helps to facilitate or move along this reaction so that it takes place at a pace that is suitable for life to be sustained. So there are different mechanisms by which enzymes can work and can be regulated by the body or the, the cell. And one of those, which this video talked about, is called non-competitive. So, Enzymes are going to be those specialized proteins whose job is to increase the rate of a reaction by reducing the, um, lowering the amount of energy that's required to go into that, or we call that the activation of energy or energy activation of it. So whenever we see an enzyme, I want you to think protein. All enzymes are always protein, but not all proteins are always enzymes. So when you see enzyme, I want you to think protein, protein, protein. When you see the term substrate, I want you to think this is the entity or that thing that's being worked on by the enzyme. So enzymes don't always have to break things down, they can also build things back up. So what the job is of the enzyme, whether it's a breaking down enzyme or a building up enzyme, that's really of non-importance to us right now. What we're more concerned with is understanding how that enzyme can be regulated. And one of the ways that it can be regulated is through non-competitive inhibition or non-competitive reactions. So part A says, how does non-competitive inhibitor reduce an enzyme's activity? So you remember from the video with non-competitive inhibition or that method of enzymatic regulation is that the substrate is going to is supposed to fit into the active site of the enzyme and then the enzyme does its thing and it either breaks it apart or it builds it up. In non-competitive inhibition, that's where we had something bind to a site outside of the active site and it caused the active site to change shape. So since the shape of the active site was changed, then that substrate couldn't really fit on there very nicely. So the way that non-competitive inhibition works is that the inhibitor binds to the enzyme in a location other than the active site, thus changing the shape of that active site so that the substrate can no longer be built up or broken down. Part B, what would be the likely outcome if you increase the concentration of a substrate for an enzyme in the presence of a non-competitive inhibitor? So if we increase the concentration of the substrate but we also have a non-competitive inhibitor. And we understand that a non-competitive inhibitor is gonna bind at that allosteric site and cause the enzyme's active site to change shape, then would dumping more substrate or things to be worked on by the enzyme have any effect? It absolutely would not. And the reason being is that, well, the active site has been changed, so nobody is being worked on by the enzyme. So nothing is going to happen. So there would be no change in enzymatic activity because, well, the active site has been compromised, if you will. It's been changed by that, it's been changed by um, that um, non-competitive inhibitor binding at the allosteric location and changing the enzyme's active um, site, where the enzyme should normally bind. Part C. How is nevirapine used to treat HIV infection? So that just came directly from the video. And since we're talking about non-competitive inhibitors, we wanna look for answers that talk about changing the enzyme's active site or where that substrate should bind. So will it decrease the virus's ability to find host cells? No, it's not affected that at all. That's not its method of action. 
B, it alters the active site of reverse trans transcriptionase, decreasing the enzyme's activity. Well, we're talking about non-competitive inhibition, and that's actually the exact definition of non-competitive inhibi non inhibition, where the active site of the enzyme has now been altered, so it decreases the enzyme's activity. So the, the enzyme can no longer do its job. So the correct answer for this one is letter B. Okay, so now we're going to move on to competitive inhibition. So if non-competitive inhibition meant changing the active site so that nothing could fit onto it, then competitive inhibition means that, well, the substrate is going to have to outcompete the inhibitor or the inhibitor is going to have to outcompete the substrate for space on that active site. So a lot of you all are going to programs such as uh, physician's assistants, medical school, medical, become medical students, or going to med school, or going to nursing school, or going to pharmacy school, and a lot of these programs are really competitive. So when someone said that a program is competitive, that usually means that it's kind of difficult to get into because there are only 20 seats, but there are 200 people that are applying for these seats. I want you to keep that in mind as you watch this video about competitive inhibition and see how those two analogies relate to one another. So pause me and go have a look at the video. All right, welcome back. So, as you saw with competitive inhibition, the com inhibitor will actually outcompete the substrate for activity on that enzyme's active site. So as a result, the substrate, the thing that's supposed to be built up or broken down, doesn't get to do so because there is something that's preventing or inhibiting it from taking that seat. So just as if you didn't get into this round of nursing school or this round of uh, med school, it may be because there were other applicants that outcompeted you for that seat. So I hope you were able to see how that analogy works. So part A. How does a competitive inhibitor slow enzyme catalysis? Well, does it degrade the substrate? No, nope, the inhibitor doesn't touch the substrate at all. It never really has any contact with it unless it just accidentally bumps into it. They bind to the substrate. No, nope, they don't actually bind to the substrate. Once again, they don't really have a whole lot of connection or activity with one another. They produce toxic they produce products toxic to the enzyme. Nope, the competitive inhibitor does not degrade or produce anything toxic towards the enzyme, but what it will do is it competes, they compete with the substrate for the enzyme's active site. And if you have more of these competitive inhibitors in the presence of the substrate, then the substrate is going to have a less of a time of being broken down or built up and the enzyme won't do its job on the substrate because we have these, compet these competitive inhibitors taking their place. Part B. What enables competitive inhibitors to bind to a specific enzyme? So in order for an a inhibitor to fit into the active site of the enzyme, it has to have a shape that's pretty similar to the substrate that's supposed to fit into that active site. So we want competitive inhibitors to have a structure that resembles that of the enzyme's substrate. Part C, if high amounts of sulfonamide are in the presence of an enzyme whose substrate is normally paraaminobenzoic acid, or PABA, what outcome is expected? So if we have something, uh, an inhibitor, that are in higher amounts than that of the substrate, what do we think will happen? We, right, we don't think the enzyme is going to break down that substrate as effect <laughs> effectively and efficiently as it normally would. So we want to look for answers that say something of that nature. So will PABA products increase in concentration? No, it's supposed to be broken down, but if we have a competitive inhibitor that's out competing this normal substrate, then we really won't expect to see an increase in concentration of the byproducts of PABA because it's not being worked on. B, sulfonamide products will be in a higher concentration. Um, Remember we discussed how in these uh, situations here that the, um, the, 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 the competitive inhibitor doesn't really make any of its own necessarily um, byproducts on there. It just kind of takes, it's a placeholder, just takes the place of the substrate and keeps the enzyme from working. So what we're really looking for here is C, is that the enzyme will just pretty generally just stop doing its thing. Part D, 
which of the following statements regarding competitive inhibitors is true? So what do we know about competitive inhibitors so far? Well, we know they have a form, a, a shape that's very similar to the substrate. We know that they fit into the active site of the enzyme. We also know that in high amounts, it can actually prevent the enzyme from working at all. So let's go look at our options here. The inhibitor will destroy the substrate. Really, once again, we didn't talk about it being destroying. It will degrade the substrate. No, it doesn't really degrade the substrate. The inhibitor will destroy the enzyme. No, it won't destroy the enzyme. It won't destroy or degrade anything. What it does is just that it decreases the rate of activity for that enzyme so that its, its active site is now being occupied by this inhibitor so the enzyme is not really able to work as effectively as it normally would. All right, so now we're gonna start talking about oxidation and reduction reactions. So that whole discussion that we had on enzymes was meant to augment our lecture discussion that we've talked about for enzymes and help you to understand how enzymes are regulated. Now that you know what they do and you know how they're regulated, you can probably see a pretty clear picture on how enzymes can work in cellular respiration, which for the most part, both aerobic and anaerobic respirations are just chemical processes where we can take, um, or the cell, the bacterial cell can take the food source, break it down into smaller molecules with the help of enzymes along the way, and not only get smaller molecules out of the process, but also generate energy or ATP. And we use enzymes to facilitate or speed up this reaction. Now we understand that we don't necessarily have to have these enzymes working all the time, so we have to have a way to regulate this process. And that's where competitive and non-competitive inhibition came into play. Now we're going to talk about the very basic biochemical principle for aerobic and anaerobic respiration as well as fermentation. And that's our oxidation redox reactions or redox reactions. So our oxidation reduction reactions or redox reactions. So I want you to pause here and then I want you to go ahead and take a look at this next video. All right, welcome back. So part A, a reaction that involves a transfer of electrons from one molecule to another is referred to as A, a redox reaction. With redox reactions, we're always going to have a donor molecule and we're going to have an acceptor molecule. The donor molecule is what it's donating are electrons, and electrons carry a negative charge to them, as you saw in the animation. So those negatively charged electrons are given away. So that means that the donor molecule, when it gives away those negatively charged electrons, it's not as negative as it was before. And in order for it to be a genuine redox reaction, not only do we have this um, oxidation that takes place where we have lost an electron, we also have this reduction take place. And in reduction, that is where we are gaining an electron. And we're gaining this negatively charged entity, and that's why we use the term reduce. Now at first blush, you can seem like, whoa, that's really heavy and it seems super backwards. Seems like the molecule that gave an electron away, he should be reduced, he's got one less electron. And the molecule that received the electron, well, he's gained an electron, so he should be enhanced. We should call them reduction enhancement reactions. But it doesn't quite work that way. Remember, electrons carry a negative charge. That's why it's written as E negative. So if you have a negative charge and you give that negative charge away, you actually become more positive. So we say that you've been oxidized in biochemical terms. If you have a charge and you receive a negative charge, charge, a negative entity, you become even more negative. So your overall charge has now been reduced. An easier way to remember what happens in redox reactions is oil rig, where oil rig stands for oxidation, is the loss of hydrogens and electrons, and reduction is the gain of electrons. Ah. 
All right. So let's move on to part B. During an oxidation reaction, what happens? Well, what we've already seen in the animation and what we just learned two seconds ago, that in oxidation, it is a loss of electrons and hydrogen ions. So since we have that loss that's taking place there, then we already know to write in our little sketch pad somewhere that we do know that this guy is actually donating or giving away electrons on there and that its overall charge is going to be increasing. So let's see if we can find some responses that look like what we've just said. So the acceptor molecule gains an electron and becomes oxidized. Nope, we already established oil rig. Oxidation is a loss of electrons, so it wouldn't be an acceptor molecule. So part A doesn't work for us. Part B, the donor molecule loses an electron and becomes oxidized. That absolutely is what happened. It's what we stated that was going to happen there. So the donor molecule gets rid of, it donates an electron, and as a result, we say it has been oxidized. So for C and D, the donor molecules gain an electron and it becomes oxidized. No, remember we talked, it wasn't about gaining an electron if you're being oxidized. It is about giving something away. So then we move on to part C. Why is reduction the term used to describe the gain of an electron? So we talked about how electrons are negatively charged, and if you get an extra negatively charged thing, your overall charge is reduced. So let's see which of these responses um, corresponds to what we just established. So we have A, the electron acceptor's net charge decreases. Well, that's pretty much word for word what we were looking for. So that is our best response. So remember, electrons carry what type of charge to them? They carry a negative charge. So if you receive something more negative, then your overall charge is going to decrease. Part D, which of the following statements regarding redox reactions is true? So we've established that redox reactions are the coupling of oxidation and reduction, and that oxidation is the loss of electrons, and reduction is the gain of electrons, and we've also talked about how they have to happen here together. So which of these options best says that? Letter D, redox reactions involve an oxidation reaction coupled with a reduction action. And to give you all kind of like another idea of how this process works, Imagine if you have, not you of course, but your friend has a checking account and somehow it had these nasty, non-sufficient fun charges attached to it. So if you went to McDonald's, not you of course, your friend, goes to McDonald's and you spend $7 in a meal and you only had $5 in your account, then your account is negative $2, right? But what the bank does, so you're already negative, is that they actually give you another negative charge, a negative $25 to $35 charge. So now you went from being negative $2 to potentially negative $37. So now you're even more negative than before because you've accumulated these negative entities like those negative electrons. So that's another way to remember and understand that reduction is actually gaining more of these negative entities. All right, so we're going to go on and we're going to actually go over cellular respiration, those three very basic stages in cellular respiration in reverse. First, we're going to talk about the electron transport chain, then we'll go to Krebs cycle, and then we'll go to glycolysis. So this is actually an opposite order that you've probably learned them in lecture and definitely in the way that I present them in my lectures. So let's go ahead and pause this video and then make your way over to the animation and come right back. All right, fantastic. So, as you saw in the electron transport animation, there's a lot of stuff going on. It is pretty pretty heavy and pretty intense. So what I'm gonna do is kind of give you my own little version of what happens in the electron transport chain, and hopefully it makes it a little bit clear. So, to begin with, NADH, and FADH2 are electron carriers. They're carrying electrons and they're carrying hydrogen. So what the NADH2 and the FAD, the NADH and the FADH2 is that they bring all of the electrons and hydrogens that they've been carrying all the way from glycolysis down to this final stage. And they're gonna drop off those hydrogens and those electrons. When they drop off those hydrogens and electrons, depending on whether it's NADH or FADH2, they'll drop them off at different locations. But the whole take home message here is that these proton pumps are going to transfer these electrons from one proton carrier to the next proton carrier. 
And then finally, the final electron acceptor is going to be this oxygen over here. So this oxygen accepts the final electron. Now, as these pro uh, electrons were being transferred from one proton pump to the next, it's giving these proton pumps the energy that they need to pump out hydrogen ions. So before too long, there are more hydrogen ions that are on the outside of the membrane than there are on the inside of the membrane. So those hydrogen ions now want to, as a result of chemiosmosis, they want to come in, but they're charged, so they can't just go through the plasma membrane. So what they have to do instead is go through this special pump called ATP, ATP synthase. So as they go through the pump, it actually rotates that pump and it phosphorylates or turns ADP into ATP. So now that these hydrogens have come in, it still doesn't have an electron. So anything that hydrogens that are positively charged or protons, um, positively charged hydrogens are, are naked. They're missing their electron. They only have one to begin with, but now they're completely missing even that one. So they're going to be drawn to any entity that has extra electrons. Well, who did we decide was our final electron acceptor? Very important. Every MCAT, NCLEX, GRE subject-based test will always ask this question. What is the final electron acceptor in aerobic respiration? Well, it was oxygen. Yeah, baby. So this oxygen has this extra electrons, and it says to the hydrogen that just came in, hey, I've got electra extra electrons you want to share with me and the hydrogens are like well of course I'd want to share with you because I don't have any electrons so then they form a bond and hence we have water that comes out of this process so all of that stuff is to say what for my students I want you to really focus on what goes into the electron transport chain what comes out what goes into the electron transport chain is the NADAH and the FADH2 what comes out of the electron transport chain is going to be ATP, a tremendous amount of ATP, and you're also going to get some water. So let's go up and try to knock out these questions here. So up top, why does FADH2 yield less ATP than NADH? Well, from the animation directly, the FADH2 electrons enter the electron transport chain at a lower energy level. So as a result, they don't make nearly as much ATP. Part B, which of the following can be used as a final electron acceptor in aerobic respiration? So anytime you see aerobic, I want you to think must use oxygen. And remember, I said this is going to be a question on any NCLEX subject-based GRE um, any of these uh, tests to get into any of these professional schools on the MCAT and that answer would be B molecular oxygen is the final electron acceptor. See how does the proton gradient help ATP synthesis synthase to make ATP? Well, we talked about how those hydrogens or those protons, they can't just go across the membrane. They have to go through this special enzyme, ATP synthase. And as it comes from the outside to the inside of the membrane, it phosphorylates ADP to ATP. So protons move from the outside of the membrane to the inside of the membrane. And D, iron is considered an essential element for many bacteria. Based on the animation, how would a lack of iron affect energy production of said bacteria? Well, the lack of iron would mean there's a lack of a hemigroup, and thus lower amounts of functioning cytochrome proteins. And since you don't have these cytochrome proteins to efficiently pump that electron or transfer that electron from one cytochrome to the next cytochrome, you're not going to make as much energy. You're definitely not going to make it as quickly because there are some side we can't get that whole transfer of electrons to, to go on, you know, without a hitch and to be attached with that oxygen. So letter A is your correct answer for this guy. And now let's move on and talk about fermentation. So a little bit of a talk about fermentation is that this is a process that does not require the use of oxygen. So not only do bacteria cells undergo fermentation, and for some bacteria, this is their main method by which they gain energy, but your cells can also undergo fermentation. Like aerobic respiration, it also involves some glycolysis. So without further ado, go ahead and pause the video here and then come on back. All right, welcome back. So part A, 
which of the following statements is true about fermentation? It's an alternative way for a cell to produce oxygen. Well, that's actually the opposite of what we were talking about there. <laughs> that in fermentation, it does not require the use of oxygen at all. That's what makes it such a sweet process for um, cells to use some time. So A doesn't work for us. B, it provides additional protons to allow the electron transport chain to continue. It doesn't really do that. Um, um, it can, it doesn't really have the electron transport chain in it. The, uh, Fermentation, it's kind of like its own process to make its own amounts of ATP. So letter B doesn't work either. C, it is an alternative way to return electron carriers to their oxidized state. That, of course, does work. So let's review what it means to be in an oxidized state. So being in an oxidized state means you gained an electron or you lost it. Remember, oil rig, oxidation is lost. So that means you gave an electron away. So in order to return to its oxidized state, we have this process, fermentation process. Now, in aerobic and anaerobic respiration, we can just have these um, products go from one step, glycolysis, to the next step, the Krebs cycle, and then finally to um, the electron transport chain. So the correct answer here is going to be letter C. Part B. What is the role of pyruvic acid in fermentation? So pyruvic acid in fermentation, there's a little bit different thing that happens with it. So in glycolysis, you'll remember from the lectures, we talked about how those three carbon sugars, pyruvic acid, are now gonna be groomed to go into the Krebs cycle. With fermentation, it's kind of like it's a one-stop step. So it doesn't really have any other places that it needs to go, but it, the role of it is slight, so the role of it is slightly different. So letter A says it provides protons to be used in the electron transport chain. Remember, in fermentation, we don't have all those additional steps. We don't have the Krebs. We don't have the electron transport chain that's going to take place. So letter A doesn't work for us. B, it takes the electrons from NADH and oxidizes it back to NAD+. Well, that's kind of saying the exact same thing as we saw in letter A, where we said that fermentation is essentially an alternative way to return electron carriers, i.e. NADH and FADH2, every time you see these entities, I want you to think electron carrier. So this is an electron carrier. Um, it returns them to their oxidized state. So then since this guy has gone from being NADH to NAD, he's now been to his oxidized state. So this is the correct answer. Moving on to letter C. What is the fate of the NAD newly regenerated by fermentation? So what happens here is that it's then going to be, and this is just straight from the video, it's going to be converted to an organic acid. Part D, which of the following is an acid that is produced by fermentation? So in that, pro that video, we talked about alcohol fermentation, and we also talked about lactic acid fermentation. And we said that in alcohol fermentation, one of the byproducts from there was that we had could get carbon dioxide as a byproduct, and you think of, you know, beer has bubbles sort of thing. Um, and then we could also have... Um, lactic acid as a byproduct from lactic acid fermentation. So the two different types of acids that we can there, and there are various other acids too. So um, fermentation can make citrus acid, it can make other types of acid, but from this particular list that we're given here, the final um, acids that are produced are lactic acid and propanomic acid. And there's an entire list that's in your textbook somewhere in the chapter that talks about fermentation that talks about all the various acids that can be produced by this process. All right, so moving on to the next step that we have here. So already we've talked about fermentation and how that is a process that does not require oxygen. We talked about the electron transport chain and how that is just one of a three-part series, actually the final stage of a three-part series that is the most efficient way by which cells are able to gain energy. Now we're going to start at the top and talk about glycolysis. So glycolysis is very similar to fermentation because neither does glycolysis or fermentation require the use of oxygen? And it's actually hypothesized and believed that glycolysis was the first step of cellular respiration to actually evolve because it's got a lot of processes that are very similar to fermentation, except that the pyruvate is actually going to move to the next step, which is to get into the Krebs cycle. So go ahead and pause the video again, and let's go ahead and check out those animations and be right back. Alrighty, welcome back, and I know you enjoyed that. So for my students, you see all those intermediates that it was talking about? Don't worry about having to memorize all those intermediates. What I want you to know about the Krebs cycle, 
the electron transport chain and um, glycolysis are what are the inputs, so what goes into each, each um, step and what comes out. So starting with glycolysis, we have a six carbon sugar. That's what goes in. So that six carbon sugar gets broken down into two, in two phases. We have the investment phase and we have the payoff phase. In the investment phase, that meant that we had to actually expend some energy in order to break that six carbon sugar down into two, three carbon chains. So we had to invest two ATP to get that process started. In our payoff phase, what happens there is that after we break down and convert those three carbon sugars into um, pyruvic acid, we're actually going to generate or make four ATP. However, we always have to pay back the bank. We have to pay back what we've invested. So we have to, we can only say that we have a net gain of two ATP. A really easy analogy to think about that is that, say you wanna buy a house. Most people that wanna buy a house, you just don't have $200,000 lying around to pay for the house. So what do you do? You go to the bank. When you go to the bank, you ask for a $200,000 loan, the bank's like, sure, as long as you pay me back. So let's say that in four years, you get really lucky, and that 200, not just lucky, you were smart, and that $200,000 house is now worth $400,000. So now what can happen is that you can sell your house for $400,000 and you've got $400,000 um, back to keep, right? Nope, not quite. You don't get to keep all $400,000. You have to give the bank back too. So your net gain is just $200,000. Same thing with the ATP. So glycolysis literally means what? Glycolysis means sugar splitting. So letter D. It's breaking that sugar down into two, that six carbon sugar into two, three carbon molecules. So parts, well, that should be part B, so when all, eh, not enough in a quarter. How many net ATPs can be made from one molecule of glucose in glycolysis? So remember, we can make four, so that is like your gross, but how many do we actually get to keep? Well, we only get to keep two of those, so your net gain is going to be two. Part D. What carbon molecules remain at the end of glycolysis? Well, remember we had that pyruvic acid. So it's that pyruvic acid that's now going to be groomed and then make its way into the Krebs cycle. And then part E here. Which of the following statements about glycolysis is true? Um, does glycolysis produce glucose? No, it doesn't produce glucose, it breaks it down. Glycolysis is the main source of NADH in the cell. No, I mean, it gives you some NADH, but it's not the main source of NADH. All cells perform glycolysis. Well, not all cells perform glycolysis because some of them perform fermentation. So our best answer, and this is straight from the video, it's called the um, embedded Meyerhoff pathway. Is That's what glycolysis can also be called. So remember, I said I want you guys to know what goes in and what comes out. So some things that go into glycolysis are, one, what goes into glycolysis is glucose, six carbon sugar. What comes out of glycolysis is ATP. In fact, how many ATP? Two ATP come out of glycolysis. What also comes out of glycolysis are electron carriers at NADH. And remember what we said earlier, that every NADH molecule that you ever come across is going to make its way to the electron transport chain. That's where they all are going to go. And then the next thing that I want you to um, recognize that comes out of glycolysis is pyruvic acid. So pyruvic acid comes out, NADH comes out, ATP comes out. Those are the three things I want you to know that come out of glycolysis. All right, so on to the Krebs cycle animation. So pause me, go to this animation, and then let's discuss it. Welcome back. That was fast, wasn't it? So. In glycolysis, or not glycolysis, in the Krebs cycle, we now want to take this pyruvic acid, which is a three carbon sugar, and we want to further break it down to get more ATP, more electron carriers, and NADH, and now a new one, FADH2, and um, to go to the final stage of the electron transport chain. And then in the Krebs cycle, we also get carbon dioxide can come out of this. 
So, but in order for pyruvate to make its way into the Krebs cycle, it has to be groomed, if you will. It has to be changed a bit. And the way that it has to be changed is that it's going to have to actually be what we call decarboxylated. So straight from the animation, we saw that we took off that CO2, which we lost off into the environment, and then we added the addition of acetylcoenzyme A. So decarboxylation of pyruvic acid is what we consider in the bridge step, or how we kind of groom this pyruvic acid. So a really silly example I use in my class is that um, many years ago, um, this is when Paris Hilton and um, I forgot what her name was. I can't think of her name, but her little gal pal that got in a whole lot of trouble. I can't think of her name. Um, but this is back then, so this is like, you know, the stone ages for all you 18 and 19 year olds. Um, my husband and I and some friends were in South Beach, or, and we got an opportunity to go to this club. And at this club, Shaq was supposed to be in there, and Lindsay Lohan, that's her name. Lindsay Lohan was supposed to be there, and Paris Hilton, like all of these really, you know, seemingly important people, right? So in order for us to get into this club, or for any club, do you think you can just go in there dressed in your normal day-to-day -day street clothes? Absolutely not. You're going to have to be changed in order to get into club Krebs, right? So um, imagine that pyruvic acid is the same way. It wants to get in this really posh club, but it can't get in dressed the way it is. It can't get in as a three-carbon sugar. It's got to be decarboxylated. It's got to take off some of that CO2. It's got to get changed. And not only can it have to take off that CO2, it's also got to add on something really fancy. And that thing really fancy is acetylcoenzyme A. So that's what's happening in that grooming stage of the Krebs cycle. Part B here, based on the animation, how many electron acceptors do we make in the Krebs cycle? And remember that cycle is going to turn twice. How many times it going? Why is it going to turn twice? Well, it turns twice for um, the two pyruvic acids that go in there. And so we're going to make four electron carriers to go that are going to come out of the Krebs cycle. Next one here, what is the fate of the metabolites during um, respiration there? So those metabolites or those things that went in that groomed pyruvic acid, where it's no longer pyruvic acid, it was decarboxylated, it took off a of CO2, hooked up with coenzyme A, and it was called acetylcoenzyme A. That's what got into the Krebs cycle. Notice that what came into the Krebs cycle is not what came out of it. We had electron carriers, we had ATP, and we had carbon dioxide. So what happens here is that that acetylcoenzyme A has now been completely oxidized to carbon dioxide and water. So now we've talked about all those different stages of cellular respiration, um, aerobic respiration, and now we can kind of put them together and we can see how that equation of C6H12O6 plus six molecules of oxygen is going to give you um, six molecules of carbon dioxide and six molecules of H2O. So you've ever seen that formula and you've probably seen it in your book, now it sort of makes sense. That first step is glycolysis. In glycolysis, we have NADH come out, we have ATP come out, and we also have pyruvic acid come out. What went into glycolysis? Well, it was the C6H12O6. It's just a fancy way of the chemical structure for glucose. Then that pyruvic acid made its way into the Krebs cycle. But before it could get into Club Krebs, it had to be broken broken down, it had to be changed, let's say it that way, and had to be changed into acetylcoenzyme A. And how was it changed? It was decarboxylated, took off CO2, and then it hooked up with acetylcoenzyme uh, A and became acetylcoenzyme A. When it goes in, we release off more CO2, as that which comes out the Krebs cycle, we release ATP, and we also release these electron carriers, NADH and FADH2. For each of these purple NADHs and FADH2s, they're going to the electron transport chain where they will drop off their hydrogens, they'll drop off their electrons, and through the process of oxidative phosphorylation, and if you're not sure what that is, go back to this lecture that we talked about oxidative phosphorylation and go back to your chapter in your book that explains what oxidative phosphorylation is. But via oxidative phosphorylation, we make more ATP and we use oxygen to be the final electron acceptor to make water. So that what ultimately comes out of aerobic respiration is carbon dioxide, water, and energy. A tremendous amount of energy. So here we have the electron transport chain and it wants you to determine whether each of these statements correctly describes this process. So when we come down here, and so all of these terms here 
are actually duplicated here and put in the correct box. So let's go ahead and make this a little bit bigger. So a correct statement would be the final electron acceptor is oxygen. That we firmly establish. Another correct statement would be a chemical that inactivates cytochrome C so that it cannot pass electrons from on from cytochrome A would block the electron transport and ATP synthesis. Why? Because if you can't move that electron, then that proton pump doesn't have the energy it needs to pump out those hydrogens. If hydrogens can't be pumped out so that there's more of them outside the membrane than there are inside the membrane, then you can't have them come back in and synthesize ATP. This one over here, the pH of the inner membrane space in the mitochondria would be lower than the pH of the mitochondrial matrix in the actively metabolizing cell. Yes, because we have all of those extra hydrogen ions that are out there that are wanting to be pumped back in. So um, the pH is going to be lower. So hydrogen ions are, lots of hydrogen ions give us a lower pH, a pH of between one and like three. Then that fourth one down here, a toxin that causes a leak to form in the inner mitochondrial membrane, such as the protons, could bypass the ATP synthase and would prevent oxidative phosphorylation. Absolutely right. The whole shebang is that we need those hydrogens to only come through ATP synthase in order to turn that puppy and turn ADP into ATP. If we don't have those hydrogens coming in through just that pump, then you're not going to make ATP. So then everything else over here, these are all going to be incorrect or negative statements. So AT, cellular respiration versus fermentation. So we have a Billy who just started brewing beer at home and his first batch is now ready. He used the yeast Saccharomyces cerevisiae, um, which can perform both aerobic cellular respiration and fermentation. When Billy tested his beer, he determined that the alcohol content was almost zero, so there really wasn't any ethanol that was produced via this process of allegedly fermentation. What could have been present that kept this fermentation, um, from, what could have been present in the fermentation reaction apparatus that caused this problem? Well, since we know this organism can produce both aerobic respiration and fermentation, if given the option, most organisms, including Saccharomyces, will actually use oxygen if they can because it's a much more efficient way to get energy. You get more ATP and you get more energy from the use of oxygen. So if there's oxygen that's available, then it's going to readily use aerobic respiration as opposed to fermentation. So what's probably caused this problem is that there is just too much O2 getting in there. And that happens a lot for people that are making beer, especially for first timers. Um, things might not be screwed on as tight or the apparatus might not be keeping out oxygen the way that it should. And the alcohol content is super low in the beer that they're brewing simply because there's just too much oxygen introduced. And those microorganisms, they rather use oxygen if they can, if they have the equipment for it. They'd rather use oxygen because it's a much more efficient way to gain energy. So then here in our final video for this flipped activity, go ahead and pause me and come back and we'll look at cellular respiration inputs and outputs. Welcome back. So for this, we're really just going to drag these labels um, to identify inputs and outputs of cellular respiration. The inputs are fuel or glucose, so we have one six carbon um, glucose molecule that goes in. We also have six molecules of oxygen that we bring in. What ultimately comes out are six molecules of carbon dioxide in the form of gas that we exhale. And then we also have water, which our cells use for in a plethora of different activities. And then we have energy or ATP that does all the work that the cell needs to do. All right, I hope you found this. Um, this flipped activity useful and helpful and I hope it makes sense. If it does not make sense, please, please let me know. Specifically, my students let me know. Um, leave a comment down below if you're not one of my students to help this be more understandable for you. All right, ta-ta for now and I will see you all for chapter six.